Oh, hello everyone. <laughs> we are live. Welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Melissa and we are going to have an amazing speaker with us today, Dr. Parshay Patel. She's an astrophysicist and a science communicator. Uh, she received a Bachelor of Science in Physics and Astronomy from the University of Toronto. She also has her Master of Science and PhD in Astronomy and Planetary Science and Exploration from Western University. And that's where she works, in London, Ontario, at the Centre for Planetary Science and Exploration. She's an Outreach Program Coordinator. And so she does some really exciting work, working with students just like you guys. And on top of that, uh, she's an astrophysicist. So she is studying uh, disks around young stars. So they're younger than our sun. And they're just starting to form a star, but they help us to um, understand things about planet formation. So I want to give it over to Dr. Patel, who is going to give you guys an idea about what she does every day. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Thanks for joining us. Hi. It's great to have, uh, you know, such great a variety of classrooms from all over North America. I am looking forward to talk to you about what I do um, in my day-to-day -day life as well as in terms of research. So um, I'm just going to bring in my share screen so you guys can see. Uh, okay, I'm hoping you guys are able to see it. Yep. Okay, great. So, so today I'm going to talk about a few different things about my life and how I got here. Um, stars and, you know, science. Um, why is it so awesome? Why should we do it? Yep. So um, let's first talk about how I got here. Um, I actually visited, I was almost about your age when I visited a planetarium in India, in a city called Mumbai, and this is how it looks like right here. Um, and I saw, you know, I got inspired by looking at all the stars. Um, I lived in a heavily um, polluted city, so I didn't really see stars at night. Um, however, the planetarium gave me um, the wide variety of views of the northern hemisphere. And at the end of the trip, my parents uh, just decided to get me books and um, because I had lots of questions that they weren't able to answer. Um, so I ended up collecting a lot of books and you know, kept reading about stars, planets, um, galaxies, and how the universe formed. Um, I was really intrigued uh, about it. However, it wasn't until actually um, my aunt gifted me a telescope, uh, one like this one, when I was in grade nine, um, is that when I saw um, the moon and Jupiter and Saturn um, on my own terrace, um, you know, from my own backyard. And I thought that was um, pretty cool that I could just point a telescope and, you know, look at these beautiful things in the sky. So from that day, I decided that um, for my career, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an astronomer. And so um, in order to study astronomy, I moved to Canada. Uh, and so I got my uh, undergrad from University of Toronto. Here is a picture. <laughs> I know Melissa mentioned um, I went uh, there for my bachelor's. Uh, in addition to taking courses, I was able to do cool things like, um, for example, this one right here where I'm wearing an astronaut suit. Uh, we were a student run society where you know, we were trying to get people who love space bring together, um, you know, come together and talk about uh, why they like space and uh, learn more about it. Um, and then once I was done my bachelor's, I moved to Western to do my master's and my PhD. Both in my master's and my PhD, I studied disks around stars. Um, in my master's, I studied disks around massive stars, but these stars are more like our sun, so they are almost in their main sequence phase, which is um, just beyond the baby or infant phase. And I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in a couple of slides. And then once I finished my PhD, in my PhD I studied about uh, the young massive stars, which I'm gonna talk about today. And after I finished my PhD, I ended up here uh, at the Center for Planetary Science and Exploration, where uh, my day job is to basically um, a plan and organize uh, and run uh, space theme activities, events, uh, classroom workshops, um, and also host a podcast, which I'm talk to, going to talk about at the end of the, the presentation. So um, let's talk about space, because that's why we're here. Um, here is an image of a um, really beautiful area called Orion Nebula. 
this is a star forming region and each dot in this image that you're seeing is a star that is being born or has just been born. Um, so this area really interests me because as you see, there's a lot of dust and gas and there are lots of winds, if you can see right here. Um, there are these massive stars, uh, yet very orange stars as well. And I'll talk about how they come in very many different flavors. Um, and this, this is uh, the view that I like to look at and gaze how stars uh, you know, are actually forming. They're young, you can see them forming. So when I talked about the flavors, um, before I go any further, um, stars actually come in very many different sizes. So um, it can range anywhere from very, very small. So our sun is almost a G-type, so almost like this star right here. Uh, they can go very, very small compared to our sun, so very, very big. So they can range anywhere from 10% of its size to 50, 60 times um, the mass of our sun. So they're really, really big. And temperatures on their surface can range anywhere from three to 30,000. So some of them are really hot stars. Our sun comparatively is not very, very hot when you look at this picture. So the hottest star is right here, the biggest one. And then the coolest one is right here, the M type. The ones that I like to study actually are B type stars. And I'll tell you why in a bit when we, when we get how they actually form. Um, so for now, we're going to concentrate on these massive stars right here. The one um, funny thing about the massive stars are that they actually live shorter lifetime compared to the, um, the smaller ones. Smaller ones, um, they live a very, very long life uh, compared to the, to the massive stars. So it's very, very hard to catch these massive stars, um, you know, in, ma in many different phases of life because they, they are born quickly, they live off really quickly, they die off very quickly. So that makes it very, uh, very, very unique to actually catch them, um, you know, um, being born or, or actually dying. So back to the previous picture that I showed you of the Orion Nebula. Um, in this cloud of gas and dust, you can get uh, these regions where you would find a lot of gas and dust being clumped into um, or denser regions of these um, dust and um, gas. And in that, you can find areas where you would see these clumps basically attracting a lot of material around them. And what ends up being is what you can see right here. So the gravity is pulling everything together. So the more denser the area is, the more material is flowing on to this object, which is then going to become a star. So it goes from this near nearly beautiful a spread out cloud to very clumpy regions that you can see right here to a star that looks like this with a lot of dust and debris around and this is one of the reasons why we want to study massive stars is because they are hidden behind this dust and gas you don't really see them while they're being born for young stars like our sun or sorry um, smaller stars like our sun um, they take time to get to this place and beyond. So we are able to actually see what's happening and how the star is being formed. But for massive stars, we don't really get that opportunity to see exactly how the star forms. And this is where um, we have to use other kind of indirect methods to find out what is happening um, through the star in the center. Okay. So here is a few other examples. So the image I showed you before um, was actually artist conception. Here are some of the real images of the star being formed in this Orion Nebula that I showed you before. And they are called popoids. Um, that's the short form for protoplanetary disk. Um, and Hubble has actually imaged more than 200 of these. And some of these are seen right here. So you have wide variety. You have small disk. You have sometimes a lot of wind blowing them away. So you can see there's a tail right here. Um, or you can have a simple one where you just see a silhouette of the of the disk and you see a bright object in the middle, which is the star being formed. So these images kind of give us a really good snapshot of how um, the stars, the massive stars are being born. And different images tell us different things that are happening to these stars. And just like how and humans have a life uh, different experiences. The same thing with stars. You have different uh, things that are happening to different stars depending on their environment. 
and we can learn a lot from the these pictures that we have um, especially because Orion Nebula is very, very close to us comparatively, um, and that allows us to see these um, beautiful um, stars being formed. So here is um, a video that was created by NASA. It was just released in January, and I find it, this really cool. So again, this is the Orion Nebula that I just showed you a picture of. However, with the data they had, they were able to make um, a 3D version of it. So the, once I start, it's going to look like as if you are in a spaceship going through the Orion Nebula. And it's really beautiful. So let's check it out. You're looking at these all these white stars. They're really, really bright ones. You're looking at this dust cloud now. You're almost passing through it. And then you're seeing all these stars that are being born right here. I find this video fascinating because before january i don't think we had any videos of um, star forming regions you know almost feeling like you are uh, driving um your own spaceship through through these star forming regions so pretty cool okay so um not only that not only the images i showed you before but we have bigger and better telescopes now and we are actually able to image the disks and the planets you know, um, being formed around these stars. And this is an image of, of a disk around a star called HL Tauri. You don't really need to know the name. But the best thing about this image is that you're actually able to see the disk really clearly compared to the pictures I showed you before. And as we look into the future, I think we're only going to get better and better images. So we are living in a very, very exciting time when it comes to um you know actually looking at images of stars and planets being formed okay so what do i actually study so um going back to that image that i showed you before um i study b, b type stars why you, you can ask why b and not a or o that's because o type stars they form so fast um, that we don't even see them forming. We basically almost see them when, you know, they are um, in their um, main sequence or just past that infant phase. For A-type stars, they're more similar to sun-like stars and you can actually see them um, forming almost at their very end of their, um, you know, infant phase. B, however, forms this really nice link between A and O. So we can gather what's happening to O type stars by just looking at what's happening to B type stars and kind of deciphering, um, you know, what would happen if you were to scale it up to O type stars. So they become a really nice bridge between the two different um, category of high mass stars and low mass stars. That's why I love studying the B type stars. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk. So they're massive, they're four to 10 times the mass of our sun, and their temperature on the surface can range anywhere from 12 to 30,000. Our sun is only 6,000, so they're pretty hot compared to our, to our sun. And if you were to go to one of these stars, this is what you think you know, it would look like. You would have lots of winds that's blowing, you have a lot of gas and dust right here, Close to the star, you have a lot of gas that is being blown away by the wind. And then in, in the background, you might have other stars that you can see. Okay, so this is what your um, visual, visualization of the area would be of how these stars would look like while they're forming. Now, here is another cartoonish version of what it would look like. And what I like to study actually is the, the region that is very, very close to this star. What a lot of people like to study is, is the region that's further away, where the actual planets are forming. So right here in this area, you're seeing a lot of these pebble boulder size objects forming. Um, this is what eventually end up to become planets. However, I like to study regions that is very, very close to the star right here, okay, that is completely gaseous. Now you would say, why study you know, something that is very close to the star? It actually can tell you a lot about how the star is forming just by understanding the disk right here. Remember, we are not able to see any of this stuff. So we are not able to see any of the regions that are closer because you can imagine this is a disk right here and your view is gonna be blocked because of this dust right here, okay? 
So we have to use indirect methods to figure out what this area is. And then based on that, figure out what is it doing to the star in order for it, for it to form. Okay. So let's look at another cartoonized version. This is, you know, if I were to slice the disk in uh, from sideways, this is what it would look like. A very, very large um, whitish blue star right here. You have gaseous disk and then you have dust and gas mixed up right here. Okay. Um, and we'll just concentrate on this one part. Of the disc. So feel free to ask me about the rest of the disc if you like in the, in the Q&A. Okay, so what do I do? So I take observations using telescopes such as the Canada France Hawaii telescope in Hawaii um, and use that um, observations that I find um, and you know obviously you can ask for the observations or um, you have to submit a proposal and compete, which is one of the things that you do as a scientist, competing for time on telescopes. Um, and once I have the data, um, basically I compare it with computational models. So in this day and age, we do everything with computers. Um, I know the physics, I have the observations, I code in the physics to the computer and generate the same kind of disk and star that I'm looking at, okay? So here's an example. This is an image from one of our codes that we have created where we have a star right here in the center. And then we have created a disk around it. So now I will compare this to the observations that I've found and try to figure out how far the disk goes close to the star. How does the disk look like? What's the temperature? Um, how dense is the disk? What is it made up of? Things like that. Okay, so there are lots of different things you can understand just by um, just by doing this. So just to uh, kind of wrap up again, we take observations, we generate computational models, and then we compare the two. As simple as that. Okay. Um, so what do we find? What do we find when I when we do that? I was lucky enough in my in my PhD that I was able to get observations from uh, you know such places as the CFHT. Um, but also find observations from other astronomers um, who were happy to land me their observations. And I was able to compare um, these stars that are just being formed, but yeah, very, very massive compared to our sun. And so what we found was that the, these disks that form around massive stars compared to something like our sun-like stars are very, very different, okay? Um, the disks around massive stars almost touch the star. Okay, they transfer all the material directly onto the star. That's not actually how the sun does. The sun uses what we call magnetic fields to transfer all the material. So it transfers into, uh, onto the star using these loops that you see. Here is an example of a purple loop that I put in. Um, they transfer all the material from the loop onto the star. For massive ones, they just do it right onto the star. And that is a very crucial difference between how massive stars form, they can accrete a lot of material onto their star. Um, the sun-like stars, there is a break before you can actually accrete a lot of material, and so that allows them to keep in the, the lower mass regime compared to the massive stars. So that was something that we were able to find using our code. Um, and I'm glad to um, you know, kind of say that this has opened a new um, area of understanding how these massive stars are forming uh, and people are still continuing uh, to kind of understand what implications this just could have on massive stars and how planets which form right here um, actually affect the formation of stars. Okay, so kind of a take-home message is that massive stars and the disks around them are very interesting. That's why I study them. Um, they have effects on the planet formation, but also how the stars form. Um, and this is something, because we cannot see directly, we have to use indirect methods. Um, and luckily we have been able to decipher these indirect methods to say the formation of these massive stars is very different compared to um, sun-like stars or stars that are younger than our sun or smaller than our sun. So that's kind of what I do in my in my research, um, in addition to that, my current job involves um, actually working as an outreach coordinator where I develop curriculum, 
um, for K-12 um, and also organize large scale events, um, work with teachers um, to provide them with resources. And um, we also run a podcast. I've been running a podcast talking about all things space with a lot of different um, hosts um, and why they love what they're doing. Uh, and in my free time, sometimes I like to skate, something that is dear to my heart. I used to be a skater uh, when I grew up. Um, and I also like to go camping and hiking. Canada is a lovely place to do that. Uh, and I love camping because I can actually look at the night sky. Um, and so in my spare time, I also like to take lots of beautiful pictures of the night sky. And here are some of the examples from my previous trips. Um, so if you guys ever go camping, make sure to look up in the night sky and look for the galaxy. Really nice band of milky um, area that you can see in the night sky. That's our own Milky Way. This is where we reside. Um, and it allows me to kind of uh, bring back the connection of what I do and why I do just by looking at the night sky. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to take your questions now. Does anyone have any questions for you? Awesome. Thank you so much, Parshadi. OK, guys, so I see that we got a lot of really great, excited faces ready with their questions. So I'm just going to go down my list. I hope that's OK. So Mr. Jancy's class, you guys are first on my list here. Um, do you guys have any questions? Let's see. Looks like you're muted. I'm going to see if I can't unmute you. Are you able to push that button for us? Yeah, we have a, we have a question. First of all, thanks for the uh, fantastic talk. Thank you. Are gas planets formed differently from solid planets in half? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so gas planets um, are formed further away. Um, as you see in our solar system, at least, you have uh, solid planets forming very, very close to the star. You have the four terrestrial planets and then the four gas giants. Um, they form differently in a way. The amount of material that they have in the surrounding is what they are creating onto themselves. Basically, the gravity is pulling them to the center. Compared to the uh, terrestrial, you have a lot of heavier elements closer to the stars. So you get a lot of um, rocky planets closer to the stars. So, it's basically what their environment is. If you're closer to the star, you have heavier elements, you get terrestrial planets or rocky planets. The further away, there's a lot of gas, and you create a lot of gas, and you get gaseous planets. Does that make sense? That was a great question, Ben. <laughs> awesome. OK. Well, we'll come back to you guys for another question in a minute. Let's go to our next class, which was Ms. Vanderzee's class. So I think you might also be on mute. Um, let's see if I can hear you. Are we good? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, uh, so if there's gas and dust disks around the star, do the planets form inside of that or outside of it? Yeah, so remember I showed you two different regions where close to the star you have just gas. And then further away, you have gas and dust. So the regions where there's gas and dust, this is where actually the, star, the planets form. Because that dust basically collides with each other, forms small stones, boulders, and you know, keeps going on and on. And then you start getting um, bigger, I guess, minor planets and then bigger planets. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay. okay. Do you guys have a question? I, you, I think you are muted, and I don't think that I can unmute you. I'm sorry. Whose class was that you were asking? We see you, but we can't hear you. Sorry, I can't unmute your microphone. <laughs> Which class are you asking? There we go. Um, this is for the Four Green School. Oh, that's us, four screen. Yeah. Okay. Austin, Austin, has, Austin has a question for you. Have you ever been in space? No, but maybe I will go in maybe 50 years. I don't know. I have not been to space. I would love to go to space, um, but I have, you know, not applied to be an astronaut yet. So, can, we, can we ask one more question or are we just doing one at a time? 
Um, sure, go ahead and ask one more question. How long did it take you to gather this information? Oh, wow. So the, all the stuff that I just presented. So for my research, it took me um, four years of my PhD. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. Four years, um, and I'm still continuing it on a very smaller scale. So it's been six years since I've been studying these kinds of stars. Thank you so much for the information. You're welcome. Awesome. I think we'll have time to come back for more questions, too. So um, get your other questions ready. But right now, we'll go to Miss Hawk's class in Mountain View School. Let's see if I, I can't unmute you guys either. <laughs> Do you guys have a question? Let's see. Hello. Do you guys have a question? What happens if there's a black hole in the middle of the galaxy? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. What happens if there's a black hole in the middle of the galaxy? So actually, all um, all massive, all big galaxies are known to have uh, supermassive black holes in the middle. Sorry to burst your bubble. We do have one in our own galaxy too. Um, however, because we're further away, it doesn't really harm us or it does anything to us. Um, for stars that are closer to it, um, given its gravity, it's just trying to pull everything in. Uh, so you can get stars that are being eaten away by the black holes. Um, however, I don't think we have had any um, observations that actually find them being eaten away alive. <laughs> but that would be cool to have. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to put you guys on mute again. And we'll go to um, the Centennial Public School in Georgetown. Let's see if I can unmute your microphone. <laughs> I don't think I can. Are you guys able to come off mute? We can see you. <laughs> we just can't hear you. Um, let's see, I can't unmute you guys. We can see you guys. <laughs> Oh, she's going to oh, type out a question. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Sounds great. We got some nice dance moves in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our grade six class in Georgetown. This is how many different stars do you study? Ooh, so I actually study only so one study type one. of star. Um, that's what I did in my PhD. But for my master's, I studied Similar yet a little bit different stars. So in my PhD, I studied young massive stars. In my master's, I studied not so young, but massive stars. <laughs> so they're still the same. They're, they, they're both massive. They're just in different phases of life when I was studying them. Awesome. Great question. OK, let's go back to this talk. We've got like 10 more, 12 more minutes to ask some questions. So I hope you guys have lots. Mr. Dancy's class, do you guys have another question? Yeah, we got another question. Thank you. Hey. What made you become an Um, So I was really hooked when I looked at um, the different planets and the moons through the telescope. And so I always wondered, how do they form? Why are there so many different kinds? Um, and how would it look like, you know, amongst other stars if I were to go to another solar system? Uh, and so that actually got me into, you know, becoming an astrophysicist. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Next on our list was Miss Vanderzee's class. Yep, and I think we have another question. Sini, did you want to ask? I don't know if it's not showing our class, but that's okay. Go ahead. So how are black holes made? Ooh, so when these very, very massive stars die, um, 
just because there's so much mass that they come in. These are the O-type stars, some of the beams, mostly O-type stars, um, they come in so much mass when they're dying, so they are going supernova, and the center still has so much mass, sucks everything inside, including the light that you cannot even see, and that's why it becomes a black hole. It's really black. It does not even transmit light back. So the way we see stars is because they are shining bright, right? For the black holes, they don't even um, do that. And that's all because of the mass. They're, they come from the very, very massive stars that we see in the universe. Thank you. Can we ask one more question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Hey, Olivia. Okay. So, um, really loud. Oh, sorry. Um, I was like, I thought that like the sizes of the stars depended on how far they were away. So like, I didn't really know before this that our uh, stars could be different sizes. I thought they were all just like within the same size group, and it was just depending on whether they were close or far. So, yeah, no, yeah. so you could have very many variety of the ones that I showed you. Um, and they, the further ones, uh, the ones that we actually see in the night sky are mostly blue. That's because the bigger they are, the brighter they are, the more easier they are to see, right? So it doesn't mean that the further away there aren't any small ones, the ones that are, it's just that they're so faint that we won't be able to see them. Does that make sense? Yes. Great question, guys. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, Ms. Strahan, class, yep. Forest Green School. Okay, Ian has a question for you. Um, uh, okay. What happens if, if a planet is formed near a star, and will the star still be the exact same? Yeah, so we do find a lot of massive planets um, going around the star, very, very close to a star. Um, what would affect the formation of the star is actually from where the disk is forming. So if the disk is very, very dense uh, and it's giving out a lot of material onto the star, you could make it more bigger and, you know, bigger star compared to what you would expect if the, the disk was a little bit further away and it wasn't as dense. Okay. Um, when it's already formed the planet, you could uh, potentially um, either have planet being ejected out, depending on where the other planets are, or you could basically have planet smashed in to the star, depending again on its size. You could have something like an asteroid that bumps into the star and it's basically destroyed. <laughs> really good cool. question. Uh, anyone else have a question? Isaac has a question for you. Um, why is there a black hole in the center of our galaxy? Just one. It's massive. It tracks a lot of things. Okay, so most of the massive galaxies have black holes in the center. They like to attract things, keep things together. So it's not so much why do we have a black hole in the center. It's okay. Why, why did the black hole attract the planets? Right, like because without the black <laughs> hole, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, that's true. It it collects a lot of material from which a lot of the stars form, and one of our stars form for that material too. Yeah, sometimes like cause and effect. Was it the black hole formed because of the planets, or the other way around? <laughs> yeah, it's like the chicken and egg. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Next up is Miss Hawk's class. Miss Hawk, did you guys have any questions? Oh, you guys are still on mute. I'm sorry. I can't unmute you. We can see you. <laughs> there we go. Um, when did we become interested in the solar system? Um, it was it was the telescope when I when I looked looked at the moon, looked at the craters on the moon, um, looked at uh, the rings of Saturn and the clouds on Jupiter. Um, and it wasn't actually a very big telescope. It was like the size. It wasn't really big, but I was able to see all those things and. That's when I got really interested in, in the solar system. Awesome. <laughs> I hope you guys get the chance to look at a telescope one day. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, do you have another question? Yeah. Um, who's your favorite astronomer? Oh, who's my favorite astronomer? Um, I'm kind of biased because I study the stars. Um, they're called Herbig AEBE stars, and they're named after George Herbig who was an astronomer who found those kinds of stars. So I kind of 
you know, he's my favorite because I'm studying the stars that he discovered. I'm kind of biased. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay, we already have a question typed in from our grade sixes at Centennial Public School. They said, have they found any signs of life? Oh, it's a really good question. I always get this question when <laughs> uh, talking to the public. So we actually have not found anything outside Earth, uh, but I'm hoping we do. <laughs> uh, I don't think it would be um, uncommon for us to find a microbial life, just we haven't found it. Um, it'll probably be quite some time before we do, because we do need missions to places where there is water that exists in the solar system and you know, keep our fingers crossed to maybe find something uh, small, but life. <laughs> yeah, why do you think it would be microbial life uh, would be one of the easiest things for us to find? Because I think the probability of having a smaller um, form of life form, it would be more easier to, you know, because we evolved from that. So it's easier to build small things than to actually build a big one. So I think it would be easier to find microbial life. Um, maybe not as much as you know alien intelligent life like we like to say it so yeah i think microbial life is probably more common than intelligent aliens awesome we are the intelligent aliens yeah. <laughs> awesome okay we have time for one more question from every class so we'll do it really quick mr jancy's class do you guys have a final question who is it Okay, yeah, we have one more question. Um, how was our Earth form? Does it form similar as um, some of the planets that you were talking about since it's closer to the sun, or was it formed in a different way? So um, the first initial questions you guys had were, um, we have the rocky planets to um, closer to the star. Uh, you have gas planets further away. Um, in our solar system, we know that's generally how it forms. For outside the solar system, we have actually found um, different kinds where we have giant gas, uh, gas giant planets very, very close to the star, um, where we think they actually moved closer to its star and further away. Um, so our Earth, um, in our understanding of the solar system, um, we think they formed just like Mercury, Venus, or Mars formed in our solar system closer to the star, where they are today, approximately. Awesome. Yeah, great question, guys. Okay, next up uh, is Ms. Van Der Zee's class. Do you guys have a final question? We do have a final question. Jacqueline, do you want to ask? Sure. Uh, do you hope to advance your career in any way and study other types of stars, or are you going to stick with uh, type B? Um, so in my actually undergraduate degree, I was able to do research and I studied how planets migrate um, around sun-like stars. And so if I were to deviate, which I probably would not because there's lots of meters around massive stars, um, if I were to deviate, that would be the route I would take for the sun-like stars and just surround them. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Great question, guys. All right. So, Ms. Strahan's class, do you guys have final question? Yeah, Bradley has a question for you. Uh, if a galaxy were to collide with another galaxy, would anything happen to the stars or planets? Um, maybe not to us. If we were to, so we will prop, we will collide in a few billions of years with Andromeda. Um, but uh. We don't think anything would happen to us. However, um, there will certainly be a lot of chaos going on with a lot of these stars that are colliding with other stars. Um, overall, there would be a lot of structural change um, in, the, in the galaxy. Um, whether or not we are gonna be colliding with something, that's very, very hard to say, depending on you know um, what we are colliding with or uh, in terms of two general galaxies colliding, you could have stars and if they have planets, um, be either destroyed, ejected, or merged with another system. So there's a lot of complex dynamics that goes in there. And so it's kind of hard to say what would happen, but certainly there will be a lot of changes that would happen. Very, very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Great question, guys. Okay, Ms. Fox class, final question. Um, 
What year did, did um scientists discover a black hole? Hmm, good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. It has to be in the last two decades. I just don't know the exact number, I'm sorry. Mel, do you know? What was the the question? So the question was, uh, which year was the first black hole detect discovered? Oh, yeah. It's like in the last two decades. I just, I don't know if it's. Yeah, I know Vera Rubin was studying why galaxies are spinning faster than mm -hmm. yeah. they should have and what we could see. So she was looking at dark matter. Mm -hmm. um, but I, don't, I don't think that that says anything about the black holes that we discovered. Yeah. That's a really yeah, good question. Yeah, I have no idea what it is. I'm actually going to look it up now. <laughs> We're going to look it up. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you guys an email to let you know what the answer is. <laughs> Great question. Okay. Last but not least was our students at Centennial Public School. I'm going to put them up so you guys can see them. And we're going to ask the final question, which is what would happen if a star and a planet collided? Hmm. A uh, planet would certainly be destroyed. <laughs> Sorry, unfortunately. <laughs> star has more power. <laughs> it is massive. Um, so it's certainly going to destroy the planet. There you go. Well, that was also a fantastic question. And yeah. I want to say a big thank you to you guys for coming up with so many great questions. And Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hope you guys um, enjoyed and keep, you know, looking up. Awesome. Well, I hope that you guys um, keep tuning in. We still have uh, two more days in our Women in Girls in Science and Exploring that we're celebrating because uh, February 11th was International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And so we dedicated the whole month to some amazing women and explorers. So keep tuning in and thanks for joining us today. Have a great day, guys. I'll turn your mics on so you can say goodbye. <laughs> Let's see if I can Bye. turn on. Bye.